it. We are live recording. So yeah, so welcome everybody uh, for this uh, live Q and A session with myself and James. I will let uh, James introduce himself. So the uh, the session will start with myself. I'll just go quickly with uh, some slides uh, about the motivation uh, of this uh, quantumformalism.com community and so on. Uh, uh, and then I will hand over to James to go through the course structure and then we will take questions and you can also ask questions as we go along you know whether myself as i go through these slides or when james is uh, you know uh, uh, talking about the course okay so uh the motivation for this yeah so this all thing started with my suggestion to my company during the pandemic you know 2020 I was bored at home as well, <laughs> so I was looking for something to do. Yeah, so I was like, uh, and I noticed something very interesting was that, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, quantum computing related uh, content out there, education, you know, things and, and these things. And most of them from a mathematical point of view are all basic stuff, kindergarten linear algebra stuff. You know, they learn stuff, uh, well, let's say linear algebra the right way, not in the in the abstract, in the, in the, thing, in the rigorous manner. <laughs> yeah. So um, we decided to create this in order to try to fill the gap because we noticed uh, a good chunk of those who take quantum formalism, uh, sorry, uh, quantum computing courses online, they want to progress to the next level to become, uh, because they aspire to, you know, to uh, to become professionals, for instance, you know, and, and so on. But to do that, because the abstractions haven't been built yet, are not built yet for <laughs> quantum computation. And even if they are built, I believe, you know, if you don't have solid mathematical background, you will probably... Uh, find it very hard to find anything non-trivial. That's 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 just the way things are. Yeah, and quantum computing is a, a good example of it. You know, you need to understand your Lie groups. You know, uh, you need to understand. You know, a lot of things. You know, that introductory courses don't give you. So this is exactly what we wanted to do it, but wanted to do with quantumformalism.com. But we wanted to do it in a way that's uh, not too much of a, a barrier you know we want to make it uh, like so our target audience are essentially two 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 type of people you know people um inspiring to become pros you know they are coming from a, some sort of a stem background so this is not someone coming from you know business uh, even business school if they don't have mathematics this is not for them because <laughs> you know you do i'll share in a minute what sort of a baseline mathematical thing that we need we ideally require uh, yeah, so people coming from STEM, STEM background, you know, they want to uh, technical background, whether uh, software engineering uh, or, you know, other fields, they want to come into quantum, but mathematics is has been a barrier to them because they haven't been instructed um, um, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a way that enables them to, uh, to, to get into quantum stuff. If, for example, if you want to develop quantum algorithms, they're saying you need to feel comfortable with proofs. <laughs> you know, this is one of the, one of the things, you know. <laughs> there is, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, things in, in a thing where you, you know, you talk about theorems, for example, no cloning theorems and these things, you know. If you have an algorithm, you need to show, show you know, the, uh, you need to prove what it does, you know, whether it does what, uh, what, what you claim to be in generality, 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 you know, for this type of stuff, you need to have a, a, a you know, a decent uh, um, a mathematical um, uh, background to be able to do this. This is something that you don't because the engineering uh, schools, uh, other sub subject, when they teach mathematics, they don't emphasize much on on proof uh, proof stuff. They emphasize more on the computational aspect of this, this stuff. You know, on learning how to do things, rules of doing this or doing that, as opposed to you know. Uh, proof proof making so this is one of the things that we wanted to uh, to 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 try to address and the second type of uh, audience is those who are already in the field in the industry um uh, in the quantum computing industry you know maybe they are uh, algorithm developers but they still need they want to be exposed to more abstract structures you know so these are our, 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 our like main target audience. This doesn't mean that you know someone else cannot <laughs> join. But if you are not coming or inspiring to, to you are not inspiring to become a TCU pro or you know or make some contribution to it and these things you know or you are not an existing QC pro. You just you know coming in. This is not. This is for I won't say this. Uh, our courses are not for the curious, like, uh, you know, just for the curious, <laughs> it's for the curious who want to do something with the, what they learn. That's essentially what I want to say. That's why it's everything is structured to, uh, you know, uh, for you to work hard, you know, to, to uh, you, you are challenged, you know, and so on. Um, 
this brings me to the minimum prerequisite. <laughs> so ideally, before you take our courses, you know, you need to have some sort of university level exposure to mathematics, you know, not in the mathematician's way, you know, um, if uh, just on, uh, for example, calculus, I would say even real analysis, because very often a lot of uh, undergrad courses in calculus, there's actually <laughs> analysis bundled with it, you know, so you end up doing both in, in a way. So, and also um, applied uh, linear algebra, by this I mean to separate it from the um, the abstract linear algebra that you will learn if you go to a math school. <laughs> um, in this case, like, uh, you know, you focus more on, you know, uh, on the computational aspect of linear algebra, you know, learning about matrices, how to multiply them and, you know, certain properties of some matrices and so on. Yeah. So if you have this, the minimal, this is actually the ideal sweet spot uh, for you to join uh, our, our courses. Um, in terms of timeline, so as I said before, we you know we started in 2020. We started with what I said I called foundation module. <laughs> uh, this has been uh, um, long in the in, in the makings. I don't even remember part, uh, uh, the exact things that we covered, but it's more or less these things. We started with sets. We went through basics of uh, groups. In this case, additive groups, because the, the idea was to have a, some more a way of naturally getting into vector spaces, uh, in particular complex vector spaces. Uh, and then we focus on finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. Uh, and then we went to uh, self adjoint operators or Hermitian operators because we are talking about finite dimensional. These two notions are uh, equivalent. You have to be tricky when, uh, I mean, it's a bit tricky when we deal with infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, which is what you will learn with James. And then we went through matrix groups. Uh, and then at, uh, in this case, the unitary group, because this is what's relevant to quantum computation. Uh, in, in fact, quantum mechanics, the, the unitary group, the special unitary group, and, and, and so on. And finally, at the end, we went through the basic principles of quantum mechanics, you know, the postulate. I won't say the axioms, because this is physics, it's not mathematics, <laughs> because these things can change. You know, how does the modeling, from a modeling point of view, uh, how, do, how do the mathematical object, in this case, the Hilbert space, you know, the, the, the rays, the vectors on the, on the Hilbert space are associated with the physics with the physics side you know the uh, operators are associated with the with the thing with the with the physics uh, so we went through the postulates uh, of uh, quantum mechanics and uh, i hope it was very useful uh, in fact george joined us in the foundation module uh, what did you think about foundation module george george is actually a good witness for us yeah actually i thought it was very very good uh, there was aspects of linear algebra that were new to me. I'd had, of course, both your applied linear algebra, but that was a, really about real. And the abstract course was very abstract and also didn't cover uh, complex. And then the tensor product was new to me. Okay. And then at the end, yeah, and, and then then at the end, the the matrix groups. Uh, so yeah, it, it was although it was foundational, it was stuff that was new to me. Okay, that's uh, that's good to know. Thank you, thank you for the feedback. So after the foundation module, we went uh, because the timeline for us was always to do this foundation module and then get into deeper things uh, like uh, you know um, uh, Lie groups and the representation. Uh, but before that, obviously, because Lie groups are not, <laughs> again, I will repeat, I always repeat this, you know, they are not just algebraic structures, you know, they, they have other geometric, you know, topological uh, features with them. Um, it's very important to, to know, uh, you know, what, uh, in this case, we needed to know what a smooth manifold, you know, uh, is, because a Lie group is a smooth manifold uh, also. It's not just uh, an algebraic man, uh, uh, in a group, in, uh, not just a group in the, in the algebraic sense. So we did a crash course on topology and differential geometry. Again, we started from very basic point set, very boring point set topology, you know, we define things like, uh, you know, uh, Hausdorff, you know, because this is the, the type of spaces that we need. And then we went on. We actually encountered Zarinsky topology as well, which is not useful. <laughs> well, if you are not algebraic geometer, but uh, Zarinsky topology is very, uh, very useful for those uh, for, for, for algebraic geometry and these things. And this I, actually it was I hope it was very interesting to see that uh, it wasn't metrizable. <laughs> Even, you know, you, people start to think uh, about why, why do you need something useful, uh, something like that? That's not. Uh, yeah. So yeah, we, we focus more on on thing on house stuff type of spaces because they are the natural thing for the uh, to, to lead us to uh, manifolds. So we but before that we went to metric spaces. Um, I mean uh, the, so we can get uh, you know metric topology. 
and we went to we we went to the notion the general notion we defined the general notions of a, a manifold and then we narrowed our focus to uh, mood manifolds. Um, so people have, uh, I hope, had a kind of decent exposure to what smooth manifolds are. The way they are actually, in, in terms of Lie groups, you know, the way the manifold structure and smooth structure and the group structure interact with each other, this is something that we will do next in, in, in the thing after uh, the current crash course on group theory that we are doing. So we did the topology and differential geometry. The final piece of the puzzle is to do the uh, group theories, uh, which what we are doing, I will wrap this thing up as soon as possible, while people are uh, at the same time taking uh, James's uh, um, uh, course. But yeah, um, we started on this current course, we started with semi-groups, we went to, uh, to monoids, and then we went through abstract groups with the emphasis on a special type of groups, like cyclic groups, which we then did uh, uh, a session on the application of it into cryptography. In this case, uh, we um, focus on the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol. This is actually uh, another uh, thing I will ask George. How was it? This uh, the application. Do you like this format of going through abstract stuff and then having a session doing the uh, an application of it? Because this is something that we can do also in James's course, especially once he reaches to the uh, to Hilbert spaces. No, I, I I thought that was very good, and actually kind of cutting edge like the reaching the boundary of what we know and what we can do and uh the connection to the of the abstraction which we covered with the cyclic groups the uh group of you know modular multiplication group of modular units how that applied to cryptography that was fascinating so okay. I, I I enjoyed that a lot, and I hope okay. that was also good for maybe the more practically oriented people to see the value of the abstractions. Yeah, and speaking on cryptography, I'm working on something else <laughs> with uh, James Norden, with uh, with Yu Sheng and uh, and um, uh, Nathaniel, the two algebraic geometers taking part on this mentorship program that I'm currently doing for a few mathematicians. So we're going to create a course on uh, discrete logarithm-based cryptography uh, with a focus on cyclic groups, but in this case with the uh, elliptic curve cryptography. So uh, we will, uh, once I have uh, the dates and the structure, this will probably be towards, it will probably start towards the end of the uh, 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 this year, early next year. So you will have plenty of time to take James's uh, course, okay? <laughs> and then you can join that. Um, okay, so that's the timeline. Thank you, George, again for your feedback. So we are at the moment in the course of uh, you know uh, group theory. The idea is after this, then we will go through uh, Lie groups and uh, uh, representation theory. But we decided to. Uh, this is, brings us the motivation for James for the current course with with James. This is also one of the reasons, but uh, because. I don't have time, and also it gave us the opportunity to uh, try a new format that James will explain in a minute. Um, but before I actually go through that, uh, what's coming in terms of uh, uh, quantum-related stuff, in terms of quantum computation? So the idea is when we go through um, the current crash course on group theory, we'll have a crash uh, a crash course on Lie groups and representations. And then soon after, because your mind is fresh, <laughs> we will have a, a virtual, maybe two weeks, poss possibly three weeks, uh, uh, virtual school uh, series where we will focus on quantum error correction and also quantum machine learning stuff. Yeah, so um, I hope this will be very useful for those of you, especially I know some of you are uh, in grad school at the moment doing PhDs or even those of you already in industry. Uh, it's very nice to, to, to see, to connect the, the mathematics with the, with, with, the thing, with the actual practical stuff um, in terms of these courses. Okay, so this brings me to the motivation of this measure theory um, and functional analysis courses is essentially I've been talking to some people uh, from the community to do uh, something to do with uh, the mathematics underpinning continuous variable quantum information, which uses infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, you know, the Hilbert spaces that uh, um, a lot of uh, people, especially those newbies coming to quantum computation, they get, in, get introduced to it is CN, you know, which is a finite dimensional Hilbert space. So this is exactly the, the motivation for this. Uh, uh, measure theory and functional analysis uh, course. And another thing, I will just add this before I uh, I hand over to James, 
um, in general, the Hilbert space uh, formalism of uh, quantum mechanics actually started with the infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. <laughs> you know, for those of you who remember the history, you know, I hope physicists will correct me, but I'm pretty sure I've, uh, um, I got this in the historical point of view. Um, there were two versions of quantum mechanics. The first version was the, the one version was the Schrodinger wave mechanics, which, uh, you know, the wave functions, which encoded the notion of state was actually, uh, uh, you know, living in this space, uh, this uh, um, L2 of uh, R3. You know, you will learn this with James. <laughs> you will get uh, to know this space, which is the space of uh, square integrable functions, integrable in the sense of the Lubeck. And the other one is uh, the, the Schrodinger picture, the Heisenberg, uh, sorry, the Heisenberg mechanics picture, um, which use lacked the notion of state, but was using the, the notion of observables. And these were encoded what he called matrices. In our case, this is like operators in this space, this very special space called uh, little L. I don't even know. James, how do you pronounce this? Uh, <laughs> I only know how to read it. I always struggle to uh, uh, to pronounce it. I, I, I call it little L2 of N, <laughs> which is this. That sounds uh, like what I would call it as I'm reading it. Yeah, yeah, we just read it like uh, a thing, you know, there's no name for it. Yeah, so this is a, an example of, uh, you know, um, um, a Hil these two are actually example of Hilbert spaces. This is exactly what von Neumann, years later, you know, he came up with the Hilbert space formalism, um, where obviously the uh, these two spaces are unitarily equivalent. Um, so they're essentially the same, it's just your choice, your preference. One of them might be more convenient to work with based on whatever physical situation that you are dealing with. So yeah, so infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces are all over the place, you know, so you need to know, you know them. Um, most physicists, when they deal with physics, you know, they are dealing with continuous uh, stuff, they deal with infinite dimensional uh, Hilbert spaces, you know. So it's, um, it's very, and to get there, to understand this, obviously, you know, there's a huge chunk of stuff for you to be able to understand this type of Hilbert spaces. This is exactly what uh, you will go through uh, with, uh, with James in this, in this course. And then, I want to comment is after this, uh, I definitely want to get, go to the next level up after this, which is the operator algebras uh, uh, level <laughs> layer. And then after that, we will have non-commutative uh, geometry because I promised that to some people on, on the thing. I think it, it should be very interesting, you know, because a lot of times, you know, uh, some mathem I know this is might be like abstract, you know, like very, very like, uh, you know, advanced for a lot of people in the in the industry and these things. But I frankly think a lot of mathematics, very often people don't try to leverage, try to use them because they are not aware of them. So the more you expose them <laughs> to, to, to people, the more they will have them, uh, you know, as a, as, a, as, a, as a thing, as a, as, as a tool you know, to try to advance, you know, uh, um, some of these uh, emerging topics. It's definitely happening in cryptography, some of the frontier stuff <laughs> that nobody taught, uh, you know, in algebraic geometry and these things are having uh, some sort of, uh, um, you know, I, I mean, huge impact. I can see it on a daily basis in some of the projects that we are working on. So, yeah, so that's it. Um, and um, I just want to say for those of you watching before I hand over to James, you know, we have a GitHub repository, so all the lectures, including the uh, the, the the courses, uh, James's uh, courses, will be there. Um, look out for the Measure Theory and Functional Analysis uh, repo, and there will be a YouTube dedicated YouTube channel. In fact, I will upload uh, upload today's session into that uh, into that uh, YouTube channel, and then later I will share it. And there is also a Discord. You know, I really encourage you to join the Discord channel. You know, uh, that's uh, the best way to engage with. Uh, everyone, including myself and James and also the other community members. Maybe you can set up a study group and so on. Um, follow us on Twitter and uh, LinkedIn. I'll stop sharing now and then I will hand over to James and then we can open up for any uh, Q&As. And then uh, that's it. I might actually give uh, my, uh, some of you already seen this, this seven tips to learning abstract mathematics. <laughs> but uh, I'll save that for uh, to the end. So James, the floor is yours. Maybe you can introduce yourself and then um, get started. Let me just stop sharing if I can. Yeah, I think I'm off. Yeah. So James, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you. Um, yes, uh, so I'm James. Uh, I finished my PhD in complex analysis, as you probably heard in the chat before we started this, um, at Syracuse University in 2018. I've been working at University of Michigan as a postdoc since then. 
Um, and I joined the Home Atopic Minds program because I've been looking to branch out of academics. And then when I was informed of this quantum formalism program and how we're using math theory and trying to apply it to more concrete situations, I, I fell in love with the idea because that's always been sort of a, a, a personal pet peeve of mine with mathematics that we do all this research and then we just sort of hoard it. And I think it's good to get it out there. Um, so I was excited and am excited to take part of this. Um, so I'm going to be running the measure theory and functional analysis course. Our goal is to eventually get to infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, but to do that, we're going to have to build up through quite a bit of uh, uh, theory first to get there. We can't just jump in cold to it. Um, so the course, I'm going to be pulling it from this book here. Can we see it? Hopefully. Real Analysis uh, by Gerald Folland. This is the standard book that a lot of graduate students and myself used. It's a highly rated book. That's the one I'm going to be following from. You don't need the book for the course, but some people might like a resource or something like that. That's the resource that I'm using, but any any measure theory resources you can find or just Google will be fine as well. It's just nice to have some supplementary resource. Um, so I want to just talk a little bit about the structure of the course. Uh, so the structure that I'm going to be using is the same structure that I used when I had to teach over the pandemic a few years ago. Um, and it was uh, the, the students I had it gave it glowing evaluations. They liked what I did. Um, so what I do is I'm just going to flat out do completely pre-recorded lectures right here on my uh, my uh, my uh, own computer. Um, and I, I sort of use a program and I just sort of write out the notes as I talk. It, it will be effectively just like sitting in a classroom, uh, except it'll be a little more aesthetically pleasing because you won't have to see me in front of the board. You'll just see what I'm writing. It worked out quite well. The students liked it. Um, and then you could easily reference any lecture. You can pause it. If you have any questions, you could like directly contact me and say, hey, at this minute you said this. I don't understand it. Um, so it worked out well. Um, the plan is, and, and we discussed this for a bit, the plan is we're going to release one lecture a week uh, for however many weeks I'm planning, roughly 20 lectures. There might be a few more, um, but that's the plan, one lecture a week, because we understand you have jobs, you have other things going on, and the material will be difficult, um, and each week to correspond with each lecture will be uh, a homework set. No, we're not going to collect it and grade it, but it'll be a problem set based on the lecture material that will help you work with the material and uh, build your understanding of it. And then a week thereafter, I'll release solutions to it so you won't ever be in the dark as to, you know, what to do to solve those problems. Um, and in addition to that, every weekend, although we haven't set a time yet, we'll we'll pull the people participating and find a good time. But every weekend, I will be personally available um, via Zoom or some sort of uh, uh, remote uh, system to have like office hours and be able to talk to the students and answer questions directly. Um, and I'm also always on Discord, so you could feel free to ping me on Discord. I'm always there. I'm happy to talk to people and answer any questions that you might have. Um, so as for background that I think would be necessary, I know we sort of touched on it. You definitely do need some calculus. You're going to need linear algebra. Um, you're going to need topology. Uh, and in the course, I'll do a refresher on not, not until later in the course, but I'll do a refresher on some basics of topology, some basics of linear. But I think the most critical thing going in is some level of exposure to epsilon delta analysis. Uh, on the, the, the quantum formalism blog, there's a post there with, uh, uh, I outlined some uh, topics to make sure you're familiar with going into it, such as uh, like, uh, infimums and supremums, um, how to work with like epsilons and basic analysis style proofs. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll cover that stuff in the lectures a little bit, but it's it makes it better for you, the viewer, if you've refreshed yourself on that before going into it. Um, 
And then an outline of the material is we'll start with a very terse analysis review and then jump into uh, measures. And in particular, one of important would be the LeBeg measure. That's the one we're going to work with because that will allow us to build up measurable functions, LeBeg measurable functions, and then the LeBeg integral. And then we'll talk about why that uh, might be better, why that is better than the Riemann integral that you're probably familiar with. And then from there, we can use that as a springboard into uh, normed vector spaces, linear functionals, and then finally Hilbert spaces. So there's sort of a path to get from basic calculus and linear algebra to the Hilbert spaces that we want to get to. Um, and I think that sums up really quickly all the things that I wanted to mention, the book I'm using, how the course is run, uh, the basic topics we'll cover. Um, and yeah, so that, that that's just all I wanted to say really quickly. But again, I want to emphasize I'm always available. If people have any questions. Um, Ah, I see that uh, I'm bored to put in the chat the uh, the link to uh, the post. Um, I'm on the Discord again. Just feel free to ping me. I'm I'm always paying attention to that. I'm happy to help anyone with any questions. Um, so yeah, that that's 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 uh, all I have to say about that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, let me just. Uh go back to this. I, I actually realized I just found a new, uh, um, learn about new functionalities. You can actually give a spotlight to, uh, to people. Yeah, so there's a, a comment on the chat. Yeah, I found the topology course difficult more than the group we're going through. I will fare this question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, the topology, I mean, um, you will be fine um, going through like uh, the first, uh, um, maybe the, the first four lectures of uh, topology, uh, where we are just on point set topology uh, before we, you know, jumped into, you know, the, uh, the, the, the thing, the, uh, what was it? Before we went to manifold stuff, this is where things uh, become a little bit more uh, complicated. But I believe for, uh, for James's uh, purposes, because what you need is to understand a bit about, you know, sigma algebras, this type of stuff to start with. And the first few sessions of our topology and uh, course, that should, uh, if you are able to refresh that, you should be good, good to go with James, I would say. The first four courses, I think, uh, sessions, uh, not courses. Because yeah. the axioms for uh, sigma algebra will be very familiar to, very resonates a lot, the, the axioms for topology. That's, that's the thing. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was about to chime in and say, yeah, the, uh, the very first, like, so I've already recorded a few lectures. The very first one is like an integration review um, from real analysis. The next one we talk about a topic called sigma algebras, and yeah, it, it, it's going to very, uh, it's going to very closely echo the very basics of topology. A sigma algebra, like a topology, is a collection of sets with certain rules. A sigma algebra is a collection of sets with just a different set of rules. Um, so it, it's, it will feel familiar, but it's also going to be a new topic starting from the ground up. Yeah, so you will have a chance actually to uh, to review the axioms. You know, it, it might be that you can actually don't need to review the topology action. You need though the set theoretic stuff. You know, you need to know your uh, you know intersections, your uh, you know unions, all this type of stuff. Yeah, I hope that was helpful. Yeah, I mean it's very. This is a thing because topology normally the way um, is let alone point set topology is not introduced to because Amir uh, is coming from engineering uh, background. This is not something that uh, he would have been exposed to in the thing in mm -hmm. in, in the in the, uh, in the university. Yeah, and the reason that I actually uh, this is actually one of the feedbacks I got a lot is I started with the abstract the point set topology in the abstraction as opposed to. Um, some of way I saw the some people are uh, like uh, they go about introducing topologies to start with the concrete, like the metric topology, you know, something that they're already familiar with, and then build abstraction, uh, you know, general mm -hmm. go to more abstract stuff. I actually think it's it's much more valuable to start with abstract. <laughs> this is my bias, obviously my 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 thing, and then 
you know, you move on into concrete stuff because at the end of the day, we want you to be able to prove stuff and these things. And very often when you start with uh, too many concrete stuff, um, there is a lot of SHS baggage, you know, with, uh, with concrete stuff, you know, you might be just dealing with one particular thing that doesn't hold in generality. So, and yeah. then it becomes a little bit more confusing. So it's much, in my point of view, it's much more helpful. That's the reason to, to start, always start with abstraction. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you want to go in something there, James. No, no, I was going to say that, in fact, uh, in one of the lectures that I just recorded, um, it's it's one of the reasons it's important to start with the abstract stuff, and I agree with that, is like if you look at the standard examples, we know like how standard length works in the real numbers. In the more general sense of a measure, it doesn't, uh, some of those nice properties don't hold. And in the lecture that I'm thinking about, one of the things I show is an example, we're used to like in the real numbers, if you take like a, 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 a geometric object and you just translate it, its measure stays the same, but in a more general uh, measure setting, that's not necessarily true. And I do an example of that in one of my lectures. So that's why, while I understand the importance of examples, it's also not really a great way to learn by just starting with a bunch of examples, because then you're going to get a lot of misconceptions that don't hold in general. Um, but one thing that I do to sort of help uh, students, because I understand that, that people in this might not be too familiar with uh, math theory or comfortable with math theory, is I sort of uh, uh, assess, how to put this, I sort of assess the pedagogical benefit of a proof. Um, and sometimes there's proofs that are so technical and so, we'll, just, we'll say fussy, that to me it's like, okay, here's the statement of the theorem we're just not going to do this proof because it's going to take away from the main point of the lecture. So I do try to keep that in mind, but there are also some proofs that are just so important you have to cover them and how they're done. Um, but I do try to make it as user friendly as I can for people who aren't comfortable with theory, um, but there's no avoiding theory. Yeah, it is. It is. It is um, um, very, very, very important. Indeed, you highlighted this uh, this point. George, do you want to comment anything on add anything to this uh, from your perspective? Yeah, I, I'd I'd actually like to emphasize examples and counterexamples, not to contradict, but I find them very helpful because a lot of times what happens is that you're adding more axioms, you know, like. Let's add a add Hausdorff axioms to a topological space, or add commutativity, or has an inverse to an algebraic structure. And I find the counterexamples really helpful. I mean, getting away from topology in the recent group theory course, we d covered semi groups and monoids, and that's where I actually learnt something that all of these pieces of the puzzle are independent, commutativity, inverse, identity, and so forth. And I found counterexamples really helpful there. So, but it, it, it's, a, it's a balance, and I can see where you can get overwhelmed with the strangeness of the examples. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um... I think it's the examples are definitely largely a, a, a part of it and very important. You you see you you need both. You need the 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 theory there to sort of give you the idea of what you're working with. But as you pointed out, the examples and counterexamples show you just how, I guess, how sharp all the assumptions and everything are. It lets you see just how all the individual pieces can rotate and move independently, or how sometimes they can't because of how the examples work. Um, one of the examples that I talk about in an early lecture is uh, something called Vitali sets, non-measurable sets, and those really sort of drive home the point that uh, what we would normally perceive as sort of a logical way of talking about measures doesn't actually hold in general. It's a complicated example, but it proves an important point. Another thing that I found helpful to myself with abstractions and axiom thinks systems is to think of them 
as a super combination microscope and telescope. So you can zoom out and see a bigger picture, you know, by removing a very specific axiom, or you can zoom in with your nitroscope microscope and add more details and focus on a particular structure. Yeah. And I, it, the challenge is actually w when it comes to applying this is to find the right setting. You know, the most general setting, you may not be able to find any particular use for it, but the most specific example is hard to generalize. So it really is an art, but I think it might help people to kind of think of this zooming in and out and get to familiar with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is actually this uh, a good segue to to this thing I wanted to share. I think some of you already seen this, but because we have more people joining in for the first time, um, I I will just share these uh, seven points. And James, feel free to add any anything, George as well. You know anything that uh, you want to add on top of this. And uh, yeah, apologize, guys. Also, if there are any typos, you know how it goes. <laughs> yeah. So for the, for the newbies, I know some of you already in this community will be with us for some time. I've shared this every time you know, there is a new course uh, starting. <laughs> I always uh, you know share this uh, these uh, seven tips. So the first one is actually is to not create friction with the thing. Embrace abstraction. Don't run away from it. You know, don't fear it. You know, <laughs> take the red pill. You know, by that I mean like um, this is actually very hard for people coming from you know applied stuff like or from like engineering background, for instance. Say you know. Uh, software. I'm looking at Amir uh, here because he's a software engineer, for instance. Uh, developers, you know, nowadays, you know, to learn something new, a new technology, a new stack or something, you know, they go to dev documentation, they read examples, you know, uh, snippets of codes and, you know, concrete stuff, and then they play around with it and then they they go and build. But I want you to, to challenge you to go the other way around. You know, when you see an abstract definition, the first thing that um, you try to not um, um, to come up with to 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 uh, the natural way for you to, uh, to 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 proceed is to say what can I do with this abstract definition? What can I construct? As opposed to can I see an example to see how this this uh, you know uh, an example of this thing that uh, you know of this uh, abstract definition for instance or, or uh, um, so take the abstraction pill you know this is how you actually learn how to construct stuff because very often you know. Uh, Maybe your theory, you have a, a, an abstract structure, but maybe that abstract structure is not what you need for your uh, for your theory. You need to build something on top of it, you know. So it comes it comes with uh, being feeling comfortable with the abstraction by trying to extract, squeeze as much as possible out of it, you know. Concrete examples will not do will not do that for you, you know, because you will just play around with a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, concrete examples. There might be like exception. <laughs> there might be a special case of the of the thing of the general of the abstract uh, uh, stuff. So embrace abstraction. You know, take the red pill. Another thing, uh, the second piece of advice is take it one step at a time to 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 the abstract concepts. And James's course is there uh, is a, a a a great example of this because everything is built on top of each, each other. If you struggle with the one prior abstract concept, it will be very hard for you to take a shortcut. So there is no hacking, uh, hack, uh, you know, there is no hack uh, around this, you know, because you're not just focused on computational aspect of things, you know, just focus on, you know, going computing this and this, and you can, you know, forge stuff, but, you know, to do proofs and, you know, to, uh, to, to progress really to have a better understanding of things, you need to really understand each piece of the puzzle, you know, understand it enough, not necessarily dive deeper because some, some things are, you know, uh, you can dive into the rabbit hole of, of, of the things, but whatever, all the stuff that uh, James will go through with, you know, for instance, you know, the, the key building blocks, you need to feel comfortable with them before, you know, try to, uh, to go to the next level, because otherwise you will at some point struggle um, to, uh, to, 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 to follow because, you know, there is some stuff behind that you, you couldn't understand quite um, in order to, uh, to, to, to progress. 
Uh, another thing is build your own, I, I, I hate to use the word intuition because this is human intuition can be very dangerous in mathematics, like uh, <laughs> like what James was describing in some of the examples that he was giving, right? Uh, yeah, but try to use your own stuff, of, you know, your own uh, thing of the abstract concept, you know, try by your, your yourself. Very often, you know, you, we are all wired differently, you know. Um, so a way of someone, you know, explaining something to you or their uh, their own intuition might not be suitable to your own way of thinking. So try to build your own intuition around things. And this comes with uh, thinking about these things, you know, very frequently, you know, the more you think about them. So this is one of the reasons I, I really recommend to study groups because this enables you to um, kind of refresh, get yourself because you can easily just take uh, the course, the class, and then few days pass by and then you forgot everything <laughs> you know you forgot the concept uh, that makes it even easier for you to, uh, i mean harder for you to to uh, to exploit you know to to, to try to uh, build uh, uh, you know something out of the stuff that you learned you know try to apply it somewhere else yeah um the third piece of uh, advice is to try to do the proofs for yourself you know before checking checking other people's uh, proof. In this case, you know, that's one of the reasons that I, I thought James idea was brilliant to hold on <laughs> the homework assignments <laughs> until, you know, the uh, everyone had a go because otherwise, you know, I would also, I would probably in the same shoe would be a little bit more tempted to say, you know what, after going, maybe spending 10 or 20 minutes of frustration. <laughs> so, you know what, <laughs> I'll just go and uh, check the solution and <laughs> and then that's it, yeah. But uh, we want to force you to actually, you know, try try your best to, to to solve stuff, you know. And the key to note is in mathematics, this is there isn't one way. Very often to prove something, there are different ways of uh, getting to the uh, to the to the same to the same conclusion. So just because uh, you didn't arrive, uh, you know, um, to the same conclusion as you know someone else, it doesn't mean you are wrong. So that's where if you find if James gives you something and you find uh, another way of proving it. That's completely different than what James is proposing. You know, share with him. You know, <laughs> he will be able to uh, to, to think. And I think they, James will find that also very interesting to see another proof of something else. <laughs> yeah. So you know, by no means. Why, you know, why don't, don't we say another correct proof of something else? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Because my students give me lots of proofs of things. Yeah. But they're yeah. not. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so try, try, try your best, and you know, don't see, don't feel discouraged because you know, it's uh, you know, it's, it's it looks completely different than you know the way that uh, James or someone else uh, or even in the test book reference, um, the stuff is presented. Okay, um, this brings me actually a good segue to the fifth point, which is if you struggle to understand the concept, you know. Um, whether through you know James's lecture or the other references and these things, that's not a problem. Very often, you know, you need to cross-reference things. You know, and nowadays there are a lot of resources online. You can go, you know, cross-reference and try to understand or go back to James, ping him on on thing on on um, what are we use Discord? Yeah, Discord, I was about yeah. to say Slack. We don't use Slack. Discord. <laughs> yeah, ping ping uh, ping James on Discord, and you know. Uh, uh, and and hopefully actually one thing that I, I i will encourage a lot before is to other members of community to try to help before james can step in because this this way you know um they themselves they are actually you know um uh, testing their knowledge right they are pushing their stuff so when somebody have a question it would be nice for like uh, someone else to try to answer it not james immediately so that way you know we can see whether you know someone else in the community um, can test themselves to put themselves forward and, uh, you know, um, showcase their knowledge and don't feel shy, you know, to get things wrong, you know, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's not, uh, that's not, uh, you know, you won't be judged by it, you know, we all make mistakes and that's how you learn actually. So, yeah. And the sixth point is uh, to set up a study group where you can, you know, uh, study with someone else, try to solve the problems very often, you know, maybe someone else understood one part <laughs> of the of the lecture that, you know, uh, you are struggling with, so they will be able to fill in the gap, you know. So this is why I, I really recommend, you know, George is doing uh, fantastic in setting up, uh, you know, uh, study groups in the in the current courses that we've been uh, that I'm currently doing on group theory, and I really recommend that you set up a group in your own time zone because we have different people from uh, different time zones. 
to, you know, it doesn't have to be with George because George is based in the, in the United States, so it doesn't have to be with, within his time zone. The key is to find someone from the community or even outside the community, you know, someone who loves this stuff, you know, and then set up a study uh, session with them. And her final one is more of a joke is, uh, whenever you feel frustrated with the abstraction, remember the following thing. <laughs> Mathematicians are like uh, Frenchmen. <laughs> Whenever you say something to them, they translate it into their own language and it becomes something completely different, entirely different. So a lot of the abstract, a lot of the abstractions that you will learn is very often they are actually abstractions of very like intuitive uh, notions that, uh, you know, we all learn in the kindergarten, uh, you know, uh, uh, school, but <laughs> they've been formalized, they've been made much more abstract because, you know, this is just the way things are because, you know, that's uh, that's 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 how you can you know you can really understand them and build stuff on top of them. Yeah, so that's 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 the thing. Don't feel abstract. The thing. This is just I would say this is the way it goes. You know. <laughs> yeah. So that's it. Uh, I don't know, um, James or George, you want to add any extra point or comment on any of the other points? And then, is there anyone who have any questions on the chat for those of you who managed to uh, tune in? Okay, yeah, I, I, I got uh, two points not to monopolize. One is to emphasize on the study groups that I'm coming into the study group, especially when we're getting into stuff I don't know, just as another student. And it's very helpful to me to try and explain what I do know to somebody else. Maybe I didn't really understand it, but if I have to explain it to somebody else, then I begin. And also something I don't understand, another member of the study group's approach might give me an aha. And my second point kind of on riffing on the mathematics as another language is for people uncomfortable with the abstraction. If you're coming from a programming background, maybe you're familiar with object-oriented programming and suddenly you have to learn functional programming, which is another language. So, but you, you, you do that as part of your practical skill base and you sort of learn after a while to translate what can be translated between the different programming languages. So, so maybe not think of the French so much as a barrier as, oh, I can pick up this word. That's the French for beer. And now I can connect, maybe make sense of that sentence in French. That's a little vague. I'm sorry, but I, I'm trying to flip that around. Gerd is kind of saying that the, the French, the mathematicians are making it inaccessible like French. But I'm flipping that on his head is you can go to <laughs> France and learn how to order a beer and, you know, learn the language. Yeah. I think this comment was made. Uh, uh, when was this made? Was this in the, in the time of um, Brubaki? <laughs> no, this would have been in the 18th century. Ah, okay. So wait, maybe he predicted Brubaki. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This would have probably been in the time of Laplace and Lagrange. Oh, okay, cool. And, but yeah, yeah it, it, it it's a funny it's a funny kind of joke, but it, that does have a serious point. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think it's also at that point where before Newton, but really then before the 18th century, anybody could learn the math, which would be like arithmetic and elementary algebra and differential. I mean, just blew it. Elementary algebra, arithmetic. Oh, and Euclidean geometry. And you would use these things in your practical life. And I think one of the things that's changed in recent times with computers, if I can rant a bit, is that they no longer teach Euclidean geometry in school, which is like one of the first places that you would see a connection between my experience geometry in everyday life. And, oh, now I'm proving something about triangles. 
And even with numbers and algebra that you now no longer learn to, on paper, do the algorithms to out multiply and divide, you just type it into a calculator. So you have no concrete connection to what's going on. But oh yeah, so I ramble again. In 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 Goethe's time, this was really the abstraction in physics and in science in general was really kicking into the point where what Lagrange or Laplace or whatever these great scientists and mathematicians Poisson, wrote. Poisson, you think uh, Poisson was, probably was also in that uh, in that time. Yes, and, and at that point, it was no longer really accessible, similar to how now quantum is maybe inaccessible to ordinary people. So, just, yeah, yeah, just a little bit of background. I'm sorry I tend to ramble, especially when I'm still working on my coffee. No, no, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for, for, the, for the thing, for the input. I'll stop sharing and then... Uh... Those who are online at the moment, do you have any questions? Or have we clarified everything, which is great? <laughs> it means we answer all the questions in advance. <laughs> we don't need to answer any question. <laughs> this is so clear, we don't even need the functional analysis course now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Any questions any, or any comment? Does anyone, uh, those of you in the audience, want to come in on stage? I can bring you on stage too. In fact, it's open stage, so anybody uh, can join, I believe. I could also add one thing here about uh, the sessions, the office hours or forum or whatever we call it with James. James, are you happy with this system, this uh, crowdcasting? Because... Um, yeah. Yeah, we, we could use this uh, because we do this already, use uh, the same system for the study sessions with George. Maybe, George, you can share about how does, now that you are a bit familiar, there was a bit of a uh, thing in the early stages because this version of the software actually is being, uh, I mean, it's, they are just uh, launching it in beta. So there are a lot of bugs and functional uh, uh, issues that it had, but I believe they are working hard to fix all that and it's better now. Uh, George, maybe you, you can give a feedback. From from my perspective, having used a multiplicity of different systems, I'd say Crowdcast is one of the best I've used, and no offense, Zoom, one of the worst. I mean, I've used some others like Jitsi Meet and Blue Jeans, and also some really Cadillac ones, which are company specific and not really affordable. But I, I find Crowdcast to be, you know, a, 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 once you get used to it, very, very flexible. And I, 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 I find the it's actually very smooth going back and forth between different people speaking or presenting, screen sharing, whatever it's. Definitely not as clunky as some of the other systems with, with yeah. that. Yeah. We actually have someone from Cloudcast register this for this session. Uh, Louise, the head of customer support, will be checking any uh, how the, the session went and, and so on and give feedback to their product team. Um, so, um, yeah. And, I mean, what, and, yeah, go ahead. One feature that I would like to see, which I've seen in one other system, I forget what it was called, but they integrated a, a, a virtual whiteboard. I, I told them about this. This would make uh, you know st uh, STEM uh, lectures on their platform very, very, very useful. You know, yeah, especially in our case because the reason I do pre-prepare the slides is because you know, <laughs> it's like uh, it's there's no other way. I would rather you know during the sessions if I could have like a whiteboard similar to what James does on his on his uh, on his thing, but it's just. It's not uh, possible. They don't have that integrated with uh, with this. Yeah, I mean, so in the study session, what we'll often do is somebody will just get something out on paper and hold it up to the camera. I mean, so there, there, there's always a way. Yeah. So, but if you find any other platform, James, any other way of uh, doing the study sessions, you know, I mean, the the, the thing, the um, is it uh, what we call it the 
discussion sessions, you know, even mm. dis is, uh, Discord, you know, anything, you know, just uh, just have a go. It, it will be like a continuous thing. We'll improve over time to see what's what's, uh, yeah. what's suitable for this format. And going forward, uh, this is actually a, a test case for us to see this uh, format versus the one that uh, I'm currently doing. Uh, at the moment, mm -hmm. this type of a weekly or bi-weekly session as opposed to the thing, yeah. So um, it will be very, 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 very good. Yeah, and I certainly look forward to uh, uh, to kick-starting the, the thing, this, this course. And we only have just uh, uh, over one week to go, yeah. Yeah, Almost, yeah. Uh, yeah. So before the first session, any anyone wants to make any comments? I know we are just uh, we are actually on time. <laughs> um, George, any final comment? I know Georgia has been handed. No, I I think we've covered everything. I, I'm also curious to, to see how the new format goes. And I look forward to it. How many lectures have you already done uh, ahead, uh, pre-recorded already, James, so far? Mm -hmm. um, now I'm uh, I'm working on the sixth one, so I already have the first five weeks, the lectures, the assignments done and ready to go. My plan is to try and always stay a month ahead, so that way when the semester begins, if I get busy, I don't fall behind. Yeah, you have uh, like a couple lectures ahead of time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I did that in my quarantine in the first, I think in the first or the second uh, course, where I did a few slides ahead of time, <laughs> but then then started sleeping. And then now I struggle to uh, like, uh, to find a few hours to do them before. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Work, uh, ahead, uh, ahead of time because, you know, then, you know, timetable changes and it becomes harder. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, any other uh, thing? I really would like to see those who are uh, online to ask any questions to James or to myself or any or make any comment, please. <laughs> if not, I understand that uh, maybe we address every. You you have no questions, but you know, surely you have something. Don't feel shy of uh, holding back. Or I can just go enjoy my ice cream in Windsor. <laughs> it's a very sunny day. Go and see the Queen. Maybe the queen will go outside and uh, wave. <laughs> I'm uh, just the next door in the uh, wind, uh, in the castle hotel. It's just you can see the the, the castle is just uh, near. So if you don't have any questions, I can go and uh, maybe uh, look at the castle and uh, eat my ice cream outside. <laughs> that sounds pretty nice. Okay, so in that case, let's uh, wrap up. Um, James, uh, you want to say any final comments before we start? Uh, we, we end. Uh, no, I'm 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 good. Uh, I think we covered everything. I'm excited to get this course going, and you know, getting to work with the people who are participating in it, and hopefully, uh, hopefully, they learn some interesting and useful mathematics. Yeah. By the way, this is not just specific to quantum. Um, I forgot to say this in the <laughs> at the beginning. A lot of the stuff that we learn will be useful also to machine learning and other things. So it's not just uh, you know quantum related stuff. So this course is really, really foundational to many other uh, things. In fact, I might do one of these, uh, this is just uh, as a side note, uh, two uh, sessions on something else that's not related to quantum um, uh, as James goes through the, the notions, the mathematical notions that uh, he will introduce you. So yeah, if you are a machine learning guy, it is, uh, this is, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be also very, very useful to you. And uh, as a matter of fact, other stuff, you know, George, can you think of any other uh, topic that you think apart from quantum that? Uh... Uh, well, and any kind of scientific computing, numerical analysis, stuff like that. I, th I think, again, one, once you go beyond using, you know, a, a, a cookbook, you really <coughs> need some of abstractions you know to translate the 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 problem into something that can be numerically approximated so, and i think actually that's where all of this finessing about epsilons and whether it's about epsilons and deltas or about topologies and measures actually has very concrete application which is does your algorithm converge 
and does it converge to something that's useful? Just a general observation. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely. So don't think this is just for, you know, uh, quantum related stuff. You will have a lot of foundation in terms of probability theory, for example, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, Kulmugorov, his uh, axiomatic approach to probability theory is, uh, is is through 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 measure, you know. So he use the language of measure theory. So, you know, a lot of the stuff, uh, you know, notions that you hear in other subjects like radon measures, all these things that have uh, uh, applications, you know, you will ha have the foundations in this course. Okay, so in that case. Uh, we leave it, leave it here then. If nobody else, I cannot see any question. Do you see any question, George? The, the chat's being quiet. Okay. Well, in that case, thank you, James and uh, George, uh, for uh, joining the stage. And uh, uh, yeah, and to everyone. Yeah, go ahead, George. Oh, just one last thing that, that people who couldn't attend, of course, they can present questions on Discord. Yeah, you can add uh, the questions on, on, on Discord to James. James is already on Discord and the thing on the measure theory channel is called M, M uh, just like the title of the, the thing, MTFA, yeah, I believe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so uh, if not, just uh, ping us on the, on, the, on the thing, on the general uh, cha uh, Discord channel, and then we'll be able to point you to the right channel. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, so that's it. Thank you so much. And... Uh, is this a comment? Thanks, everyone. I will still, I'm still the question will come in time. Okay, yeah, okay, no problem. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's a, a really an opportunity to really um, start uh, from the foundational stuff because James will do some review and analysis, some bits and bobs, and read. Please read the prerequisite reading stuff. You have maybe just over two weeks to go through some of the epsilon delta stuff for you to feel comfortable with that, you know, and then yeah. I look forward to seeing you for the for the for uh, for the first session. So yeah. So James, again, we look forward to uh, having you, and uh, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll see you uh, soon. Um, and uh, the same with George. We'll I see George next uh, next week in the in the thing in the current group theory thing. <laughs> right. Thank okay. you, Ben Borde and James, and a pleasure to meet you, James. It's great to meet you, George, and everyone, and uh, I look forward to seeing you as the course progresses. Okay. Uh, one final thing. This will be available on YouTube. I think I already said that. So, yeah, for, on that note, have a good weekend, everybody. Thank you again for, uh, for, uh, for joining the session, and, uh, yeah, and I look forward to seeing you on the, on the course. Okay. Uh, bye for now.